great. Okay, so before we start, can I refresh myself, please? Amira? Mm -hmm. Salala. Mm -hmm. Bushra? I think so. Fatima? She's sick. She's sick today. Okay. Fauzia? Great. Manal? Absent. Moza? Moza. Salwa? Yes. Sumeya? There. And Zainab? Okay. Your <coughs> face? No. No. You weren't with us, were you? No, okay, I was going to say your face is not familiar, Neuf. Okay, where are you from? Ebri. Ebri. Okay. okay, excellent. So, sorry, excuse me for not always remembering, but I'll try my absolute best. Okay, so what I would like to do today is just give you the idea for the next uh, lecture. What we're going to start off with is similar to a little bit of a test, but I hate using the word test because that always scares everyone. This is extremely, extremely easy. But I want you to ask the questions to double check that we've laid the foundation because I'm going to be discussing Bayes' theorem with you. Now Bayes' theorem and Hardy-Weinberg are slightly different. Hardy-Weinberg is when we don't have the condition in the family history, okay? Whereas Bayes' theorem is if we do have the condition in the family history. I'm not going to expect you to know the details of Bayes as it is in your textbooks, but we're going to make it very, very easy. and We're going to go through some examples of that in the next group section. Okay, so what we cover is what the expectation would be of you to do. So we use it when there is a family history of a specific disorder. But before we do that, because it's based on inheritance patterns, I'm going to quiz you a little bit about that. Okay, so please be interactive, ask questions, but I think hopefully this will be very basic. Okay, so what do we expect? What type of inheritance are we thinking about here and why? Okay, before what type, let's maybe tell me a bit about what is going on in the pedigree. Every generation is having the... Uh, Good. Every generation is affected. Okay, so we're thinking dominant. What else? Good. Males and females are affected. Fantastic. And if we look at the transmission, from a male, it can go to a female or a male, or from a female to a male or a male. Okay, so we're pretty certain that this is dominant. Okay, good. Okay, usually no skipping, but we'll talk about some <coughs> phenomenons which can happen with dominant that can allow us to understand skipping of generations in dominant. Okay, so we know that the disease manifests in the heterozygous state. So if we hold up a show of hands, obviously that looks like this. Faulty gene, working gene, this individual will be affected. Heterozygous state, mm -hmm. okay? We also know that with dominant conditions specifically, it can be, a number of cases can be de novo in origin, that there may not always be a family history of that specific condition. So conditions like neurofibromatosis have a very high de novo rate. 50% of cases can be de novo, where we might not see that typical uh, pedigree that we've seen earlier. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind when we're analyzing pedigrees and suspecting certain types of inheritance. You need to know about these facts associated with dominant pedigrees. Uh, penetrance and variability is something I want to double check you understand. Penetrance, can anyone explain that to me? Okay, a little bit more. Good start. Um, it will show how is the severity will be like and the time, the onset. Okay, a little bit more. Okay, so let's use an example of breast cancer, okay, because we're in our cancer block. Breast cancer, on average, again, you're going to get different figures, but on average has a penetrance of 80%. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Maybe each generation they will have 8%. Okay, <coughs> so the BRCA1 and 2 genes specifically, okay, penetrance is 80, more or less 80%. What that means is that if we take 100 individuals, all of them have a BRCA1 mutation or BRCA2 mutation. 80 out of those 100 will develop the disease, but 20, even though they have the underlying mutation, won't develop the disease. 
So penetrance is the number of individuals with the mutation that will develop disease. What you were highlighting was more related to variable expression. Okay, now variable expression is something and penetrance is something that is commonly seen in dominant disorders and where we may actually see skipping of generations or what appears to be skipping of generations because of penetrance which is not all individuals with a mutation will develop the condition or variable expression the condition may be less severely affecting one individual than another individual with the exact same mutation or the age of onset may be different okay or it can be so mild that you might not even recognize it clinically so to know about penetrance and variable expression will help you get a sense of the dominant inheritance okay so you may not always see that first pedigree because of variable expression or penetrance or de novo mutations okay so it may not always be as straightforward as that okay don't worry too much about um, the information at the protein level Okay, so very, very easy. Let's use this information for risk calculation. We have our father who is affected with Huntington's disease, one of the well-known dominant disorders, and we want to know the risk for his daughter, and we want to know the risk for his son. Can you tell me what the risk would be for his daughter? 50% as with dominant inheritance. Okay, first condition, the penetrance is 100%. All right. Now, what is the risk for his son? Hmm? Come on, you know it. 50%. Okay, easy. Okay, 50% for transmission and doesn't depend on the gender. Male or female, they have an equal risk. Okay, so we're all familiar with dominant. Fantastic. Okay, so now let's look at our second pedigree. What are we, what are we seeing here before you give me the inheritance pattern? Okay, skipping of generations, yeah, and males and females affected, fantastic, okay, something we're not seeing here, but something that we probably see in our population is consanguinity, so what are we thinking about? Hmm? Recessive inheritance, okay, so this may be a recessive pedigree based on those factors we've seen. Okay, good. Now with recessive pedigrees, the disease, how would it show? No. Show me with a show of hands. This is a fake, this is a mutated copy and this is, yeah. So it would manifest in the homozygous state. Okay. Or compound heterozygous if the mutations are different. Um, usually the expression is far more uniform than in dominant inheritance, which we've spoken about, can be extremely variable. Often complete penetrance, again, it makes it a little bit easier to analyze the pedigree. Mm -hmm. Usually they manifest early on. Mm -hmm. And new mutations are very rare. So you probably see a family history of something. Mm -hmm. Okay. And don't worry too much about the rest of the information. So very basically, let's come to our risk calculation. What this means is that both parents of this daughter here are carriers, genetically confirmed, so I've shaded it in in the pedigree. Okay. So their daughter is affected. What is the risk for their son? Mm -hmm. So what is the risk generally for recessive inheritance? 25%. And if that was another girl, what is her risk? So we've said here, 25% risk. If they had another girl, what's her risk? 25%. Okay, 25%. All right. Good. And that's a very important thing to explain to your patients, is that with each pregnancy, it doesn't matter if they've had one affected, the next three are not going to be unaffected. Each pregnancy has that 25% risk. And it's a difficult concept for people to understand but be familiar that you expressively discuss that point with your patients when you're talking about recessive inheritance. Because we know families that have had 12 affected in a row. Okay, we know families that have had 12 children and none of them are affected. Each one is 25%, but it's a risk calculation. We can't predict the outcome. Okay, yes, but why? 
the things on their wrists. Mm-hmm. Okay. And one more thing that's very important to always look at, not specifically each generation. Mm-mm. What's so important about this individual here and his sons? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, an affected male will never have an affected boy. Okay, and all his daughters will be? Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. Okay. I think we've covered that. Okay, so let's look at our pedigree. What is the chances? Now, we've got a mom who's a known carrier. Okay, she's actually obligate. Obligate means that she's got one affected child and another first degree relative with the condition. So without even testing, I know that she's a carrier. Okay. But she's confirmed to be a carrier. She's got an affected boy. What are the chances for her daughter to be a carrier? Okay, what are the chances for her daughter to be affected? She's a carrier and her husband. Okay, so it's, it's X-linked. So we're not too worried about the husband unless they consanguinous and then we need to make sure that the husband's not affected. So if it's X-linked recessive, we expect only males to manifest, right? Generally speaking, there are exceptions to the rule. Yes, yes exactly. Now, but what are the chances for that daughter to be a carrier? Fifty percent. Why fifty percent? Because mom has two X chromosomes. One's faulty, one's working. She either passes on the faulty or she passes on the working. Okay. So if I ask the question about a male, my answer will be different to the question if her offspring was female. Female at risk of being carriers. Male at fifty percent risk of being affected. Okay. So when we do our risk calculations, I want you to keep these concepts in mind because we can't calculate the risk if we don't know this information. Okay. Okay, this we're not going to base our risk calculation on, but just to create awareness about mitochondrial inheritance. Uh, we don't see it too often, but we do encounter it, so we need to be familiar with it. And Sometimes it's difficult to get it confused because it may look like it could be dominant or recessive or other forms of inheritance as well. So it often comes down to exclusion. But the important thing to remember is that with um, uh, mitochondrial inheritance is that all the, it's maternal transmission only, okay? That all the children have a risk of being affected. And due to homoplasmy and heteroplasmy, they may be less or more severely affected. Okay, and I don't think we need to worry about that today because we're not going to use it for our risk calculation, but I need you to be aware that there is this type of inheritance. Okay, and there'll be no transmission from the male if the, f if the husband who's affected has children. Okay, but we are always worried about every single child of the children of a mother with mitochondrial. Okay. All right, I don't think we need to worry about that. So for today, um, Muslim is going to go through some examples of Hardy-Weinberg with you. Remember, Hardy-Weinberg is something where there's no history of a genetic disorder in that family. You're looking at the incidence in the general population, okay? And you need to actually know a figure to be able to work out Hardy-Weinberg. But the base theorem that we're going to be using is we're looking at families with a genetic <coughs> disorder in the family. And we're going to use our inheritance pattern to base for the basis of that calculation. Okay. All right. Any questions?